hope this morning you will be stirred to the point of change. Not just stirred, but you'll be stirred enough to change with your outlook on what Christ is doing today. James chapter number 5. James chapter number 5. And while you're turning there, also turn over to a companion chapter, a companion passage of Scripture that we find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So turn to James chapter 5 and then put your finger there and then turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4 and, uh, and then we'll kind of have both where we can flip back and forth as we look today at what the Bible says is we're about to wrap up our series on life on display from the book of James. <clears throat> we find here, we're going to start in James chapter 5 and verse number 7. We find here three key individuals in this passage of Scripture. We find the planter in verses 7, 8, and 9. We find the prophets in verse number 10. And then we find the persecuted or Job in, in, in verses 11 and, and, and so on. And so I, I can't help but alliterate, but you kind of find those three uh, key individuals there in this passage of Scripture. But all of these individuals are mentioned as we read here about patience and about understanding the end times, we find that all of this is done in the light of the coming of the Lord. Can I just tell you this morning that the Lord is coming again? Jesus is coming back to get us. If you agree with that, say amen. I'm glad that this old world is not all that we have to look forward to, but one of these days, it won't be down here, but it'll be up there, in the sweet by and by. And so if you would, let's stand out of respect for the reading of God's Word, James chapter 5. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive, it, uh, receive the early and the latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in my name, or spoken in the name of the Lord, for an example of suffering and affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job. And I've seen the end of the Lord, and the Lord is very pitiful, and of tender mercy. Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts this morning. God, I pray that your word would literally come alive and leap off the page. May it impact our hearts. Lord, may it so stir us that we are moved to action, Lord, as we respond to the message today. Lord, may we interact in our hearts. May your spirit bear witness with our spirit. Lord, we know that all will be vain unless your spirit come and meet with us this morning. We thank you for the worship time. We thank you for the giving. We thank you for everything that's taken place. But Lord, now, Lord, now we ask you to bless your messenger and the message. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. This passage leads in with this reminder as he's talking about establishing our hearts and being patient and, and understanding that there could be persecution. This passage is really rooted in the fact that the coming of the Lord, it draweth nigh. There is a day coming when God himself, the, the, the shout of the voice of the archangel and God himself shall descend in the clouds and we're going to meet him in the air. We just sang about it in the song, The Midnight Cry. There's several times throughout the scripture that we find this mention, uh, this thing, this catching away or the coming of the Lord. And I want to talk about this for just a little bit. The Bible says in two specific instances in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 2 that this coming of the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 10 it says the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. This coming of the Lord will come so quickly that we don't even have time to get prepared for it. In fact, the Bible says in Corinthians that in the moment in the twinkling of an eye, now, I don't know how they count this, and, and, uh, and I'm not sure exactly how this happens, but I do know this, that they say that a twinkle of your eye is 200 times faster than a blinking of your eye. And you can blink your eye pretty quick. They say that some people will blink their eye as many as 200 times in one minute. Can I say that in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the, the trump of God is going to sound, and we who are alive and remain are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. There's going to be a great catch 
catching away. And so he's warning them, all of these things in your life you must do throughout the whole book of James, this whole background of these persecuted Christians. He's saying, hey, what I want you to understand is be patient, be vigilant, stand your ground, keep doing right, because the Lord is coming soon. And I'm so glad that he's coming back. I'm not looking for the undertaker, amen. I'm looking for the upper taker. And all of those who have been heaven born at that moment are going to be heaven bound. We'll no longer be earth bound, but we will be uh, heaven bound. And we find this catching away, this coming of the Lord mentioned several times. About the only time we really see it in the Gospels is in John chapter number 14 and verse number 3, where he says, and I will come again and will receive you unto myself. But we find it all through the scripture, saturated throughout Paul's epistles. And we, we think about it, I, I think even in the book of Revelation in chapter 4 and verse number 1, where he looked at John and he said, come up hither. He said, come up hither. He said, I want you to come up here. It's okay. It's just a crying baby. She can go. Uh, we got a couch back there and a TV where they can watch it. It won't bother me if it won't bother you. And, uh, and so, but uh, the, the baby's coming up hither right now. Amen. And, uh, and so, but no, the, he says, come up hither. And we find in a moment, John was caught away and was taken through the door. We find that as a picture of the rapture. Rapture is simply a Latin word that means uh, to, uh, raptura, that means to pull or divide or to lift out of or to take away by force. We also see it very clearly in the, in the sister passage, companion passage that we're going to be reading today in, in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Let me just read some verses to you. It says in verse number 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep, this is the dead, in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up, in the, uh, up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord where, now notice this, in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Then he says, comfort one another with these things. The end of the church age is when we experience the coming of the Lord. So James has really laid out all of these things, his faith and works and how we're to live. And, but then at the end, he starts warning us. He goes, hey, you better do this because the coming of the Lord is at hand. The coming of the Lord is very near. So I want to talk about an event that will take place like a thief in the night. And that event that will happen is called the rapture. There's not a lot of preaching about the rapture, and there's not a lot of people who want to tackle subjects like the rapture, but I think in the passage that we're reading today, we can't discuss anything else but understand that there is a coming of the Lord. He's coming back. Are you ready to meet him? He's coming back. Are we prepared to stand before the Lord. There was a farmer who had an old grandfather clock. This was something that my mother had, and we had a long, we had our home, uh, we had a grandfather clock in our home, and it was part of her, kind of her dowry or hope chest or whatever that they, ladies like to have, and this old grandfather clock would, you'd have to crank it, or it would start dinging slower and slower, y'all know what I'm talking about. And about once every two months or so, you'd have to go in there and crank it up a little bit, and then the, the, the pendulum would swing. And, and an old farmer was asleep one night, and I can remember as a kid waking up, and I would listen. If I was awake, I'd listen for the chimes, and then I would know exactly what time it was. Well, this old farmer, he's, uh, uh, he, he's asleep one night, and all of a sudden, his, his clock had gotten off, and, 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 and it, it was just so sun-dried out there in that Kansas heat, and they didn't have air conditioning, and the clock had just kind of twisted and warped a little bit over time, and all of a sudden, one night, he hears 16 chimes. He throws his wife out of bed. He goes, honey, get up. It's later than it's ever been before in our lives. Can I tell you that we are closer to the rapture than we've ever been at any point in our lives? Can I tell you that the coming of the Lord is more near today than it's ever been before? And you say, now, Pastor Mark, uh, preachers preached about this when I was a kid, and that was, that was uh, let's talk about somebody in the Esther class. That was 40 years ago, right, Esther class? Because you're all, you know, 42, 43 years old. I'm trying to throw them a bone, and they're not even going to laugh, Luke. So, fine, Esther class, be mean to me. 
none of you can come to the dinner tonight. So there. The coming of the Lord, he said this. He said it's closer than it's ever been. The coming of the Lord is nigh. Paul said this to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We will be joined at the rapture with our bodies. So it's closer than it's ever been in human history. You understand that the second coming happens in two phases. Number one, there's the rapture where we who are saved, whether they're dead in Christ, whether they're already buried, the saints of old, or whether it's us who are alive and remain, he said those of us will meet the Lord in the air. That's the first phase. But the second phase of the second coming of the Lord that is spoken about in in, in James chapter 5 is when the Lord himself stands upon the earth, rules for a thousand years in Israel during the millennial reign. So we've got to understand that there is a day when we who are the saved will be caught up out of here like a thief in the night. The Bible describes it like this. There'll be two in bed, one will be caught away, and the other won't even know what happened. There'll be two working in the field, one will be gone, and they don't even know what will happen. I mean, it's just going to happen so suddenly that we're not prepared for it. We're not, we're, not, we're, we're not expecting it. In fact, the Bible says this, no man knows the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. It is going to happen. So let me give you just a few things. First of all, the thief in the night, the thief in the night lifts up. There's going to be a lifting. With the thief in the night, there is going to be a lifting. Moody asked this question. Moody, D.L. Moody would always pray, and he would not close his eyes, but rather he would look up towards heaven. He would keep his eyes open, and he would look towards heaven. And, and so as he would look towards heaven, here's, here's what happened. He said this. He said, why do you always do that? He said, because God is in heaven. Because God is up. You say, well, Brother Mark, how do we know that? Genesis chapter 3 says, God went up. Mark chapter 16, verse number 9 says, he was raised up into heaven. Acts chapter 1 said, until the day he was taken up. So if we know that God and heaven is above us, can I just say that there's some things that are going to be lifted? The first thing that's going to be lifted is people. He is going to lift up people people. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse number 1 says, furthermore, we beseech you. He said, we beg you to understand that I am going to take away the people who are saved. So let's just imagine, if you will, that we've got a giant magnet. I mean, a big magnet. And this magnet is something that we're going to run over the ground and we're looking for something specific. Did you know that you can put all kinds of metals on the ground? You can put lead, you can put steel, you can put gold, you can put silver, you can put jewels, you can put copper, you can put all of these things on the ground. But do you know the only thing that is going to be lifted up is what that magnet is created to pick up. Do you know why the magnet only picks up a certain type of metal? Because that metal is made of the same substance of the magnet. Do you know who's going to go with the Lord? Only those who are made of the same substance of the Lord. Only those who are the children of God, only those who know Christ as their personal Savior will be caught up in that day to meet the Lord in the air. There is going to be a lifting of the people. And you say, well, preacher, I think, I I hope, I, I believe that if the Lord were to come today that I would go to heaven. Let me tell you, you need to know more than that. You need to know that you would be caught away today at the coming of the Lord. But not only does it lift the people, but it lifts a person. It lifts a person. I think about verse number 16, it says, in our, in our companion passage in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it says, the Lord himself will descend with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the Lord himself. I'm going to hold and take a pause right here so that we're not so distracted. Miss Jean, who are you looking for so we can say? Solomon's mother. Father's already there. We're good. They're caught up and called out. Now, lock the doors, Luke. Don't let anybody else in. Out, anywhere. Dobermans are in the parking lot. Nowhere to go. The Lord himself. Have you thought about this? That there's not a ladder, there's not a stairway, there's not an escalator, but there's only one way to heaven, and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ himself. I mean, there's a lot of songs about working my way to heaven and this and that and the other. Can I just tell you something? 
It, how many of you like NASCAR? Hold your hand up. Okay, so there's like three people that are really bored with their life. No, I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. No, <clears throat> NASCAR. Lots of circles, right? Lots of, what is it, left-hand turns? Lots of left-hand turns maybe, and sometimes then maybe you need another race where you can make a right-hand turn, but, but lots of left-hand turns. In NASCAR, Dale Earnhardt, the intimidator, was in the last turn of the last lap of the Daytona 500, and he hit the wall going 180 mile an hour, if you remember that race. Did you know that he had a safety device that he could have worn that very well could have saved him? But he would not wear the device because it said that it cost him control. He didn't want to give up the control. Can, can I say this? That we have no control over when the Lord's going to return. So we need to be ready. You say, but I just, Brother Mark, that's just not the way I'm wired. I just like to do this. And you know, one of the, I'm, 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 at, at, at Newcomer's Funeral Home right over here, I do a funeral nearly every single week for somebody who doesn't have a pastor. Can I tell you this? At Newcomer's Funeral Home, the number one song that gets played is, I did it my way. Can I tell you that's not what I want at my funeral that's going to be played because I want people to say, he didn't do it his way, but he did it God's way. He did it God's way. He lifts up a person. It also lifts up with power. Think about the power of an air show, how a plane takes off and literally shakes the ground. He has the power to lift the dead from the grave. Uh, think about those at the bottom of the sea, those who were, uh, who were buried at sea during World War I and World War II, and their bodies have just, uh, he has the power to lift them up. He has the power to lift. Bob Johnson, Bob Johnson was a missionary to Haiti. Bob Johnson was killed last year, this time of year. I drove to Missouri to his funeral. Bob Johnson came to our church when I was about a 15-year-old boy. Bob Johnson's like the modern-day Apostle Paul, just anointed of God. Bob Johnson came to our church, and he was on his way to Haiti. He was a pig farmer from Missouri that God had saved and called to preach, just a pig farmer. This pig farmer has had... He's in heaven now. He's hearing me preach now, but this pig farmer has had thousands, tens of thousands that will be in heaven with him one day. Just a pig farmer. He came to our church and he, uh, he was just weeping, trying to get raise support to get to the mission field. And he said, man, I'm praying that God will give me a guitar. I was just learning to play the guitar. I had a guitar. And the Lord just said, give him that guitar. So I kind of had this connection with Bob. I went and gave him the guitar. He didn't even know how to play it. He learned to play it and he said, man, thousands of people have heard this guitar played and sung and people accepted Christ. It was just awesome. Bob Johnson was attacked when Haiti, his family was attacked on their mission compound when Haiti had a bunch of rebels running around. And during this time, these rebels came into his house, and I, I wouldn't even go into the mixed company, but raped his wife. It was the most horrible thing that could ever happen. Just beat the family, beat him nearly to death. And all of a sudden, military trucks pulled up outside, right about the time they were going to kill him. And all the rebels fled. There was lights, there was shouting, there was yelling, there was people dismounting from the military trucks. All the rebels fled. But guess what happened? When the Johnsons got up and Bob was able to be awake and walked outside, there was no military, there was no trucks. In fact, there was tire tracks right in front of his house, but 100 feet down the road, there was no more tire tracks that way, and 100 feet down the road, there was no tire tracks that way. Can I, can I just say this? That is God. He has the power to lift. He has the power to save, and he alone has that power. Let me give you something else. Not only will there be lifting but think about this there's going to be a leaving a thief in the night this this involves a leaving he says we're going to meet the lord in the air i mean flight 777 is loading up we're getting on board and we're about to take off out of here we're about to leave this place and if you miss your flight it is never coming back what are we leaving behind you say, Pastor Mark, I mean, if, 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 if we're leaving behind, what are we leaving behind? I can tell you the first thing we're leaving behind. Look at that. We're leaving behind sin. 
I'm so glad that we will not be scarred with sin when we get to heaven. Can I have an amen to that? Everything that you struggle with today in your life, those sins that easily beset you, that sneak into your life, those will be gone. In the old day, when they used to fly hot air balloons a lot, they controlled those hot air balloons with sand. They would have these bags of sand, and they would lower and raise and, 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 and empty the sand, and that's how they would uh, control the hot air balloon. But you know what? When they wanted to go as high as they could go, they would cut loose all the sandbags and let them fall. One of these days when we're caught up in the rapture, we're cutting loose lose all of our sin we'll never experience that again laying aside every sin and every weight that so easily besets us we're leaving behind our sin but we're also leaving behind our sorrow in Revelation chapter 21 and verse number 4 the Bible says that God will wipe away all tears from their eyes have you ever seen anybody really broken I'm talking about really saddened and broken really struggling Right after, in 2003, right after we went into Iraq, I had a boy that played basketball for me. I coached his basketball team. His name was TJ, TJ Parker. And TJ was a sniper in the Marine Corps. TJ was killed. And for some reason, they couldn't catch his parents. Or I don't know exactly how it happened, but we, I was at the youth camp, and... and and for some reason, I got a phone call. I don't know if I was put on there as a... But anyway, I got this phone call that TJ had been killed. I, I didn't even believe it. I didn't even necessarily know what was going on. So <clears throat> I go sprinting over to the parents' house about the time the Marine gets there. And I mean, I'm telling you, it was sad to watch that mother and father. But then I went with them and knocked on the door of his wife, Carla their little baby, just a few months old, knocked on the door, watched the door open, watched her weep, all sorrow will be gone when we leave this earth. The pain of your heart that you can't even describe to someone else you'll no longer experience that again. Satan will be gone. The devil will be chained. He'll be bound. He'll be cast into the lake of fire. Satan will be gone. I mean, that old accuser of the brethren who every time we start to make a little progress, he wants to accuse us and he wants to bring up our past and he wants to remind us of where we've been. A little girl one time, she was asked by her parents, uh, she was asked this question. Uh, she, she, they said, uh, what, what will you do if Satan knocks on your door and tries, you to, tries to get you to do something bad? What are you going to do? Here's what the little girl said. If Satan knocks on my heart's door, I'm going to ask Jesus to answer the door. I love that song, justice called, but mercy answered. There was no way I could, oh, I just, I think about how when, when justice was what I deserved, mercy was what I got. Let me hurry. Not only has a lifting and it has a leaving, but the thief in the night has a landing. It has a landing. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Every departure, every plane that leaves has to have a place where it arrives. Not all flights are safe, but this one is. Now, let me give you just a couple things, and I'm almost through. This landing includes new bodies. This landing includes new bodies. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 21, the Bible says, Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned unto his glorious body? I'll never forget reading a newspaper about a man who was experiencing a meteor shower. And he saw these meteors, and they were burning up. And this was back in the 20s. They were burning up in the dark night sky. And he saw them, and he was an older man, and he was a Christian. And Brother Luke, he ran to the cemetery because he wanted to see his wife caught up out of the grave. You know what? He's not far off because there's going to be a day when we are caught up to meet the Lord in the air and we're going to get a new body. Now, you can see that my alliteration, I had to stretch on this second one. We're going to get some new buddies. 
You say, well, Brother Mark, now, what, what kind of new buddies are we getting? Well, here's what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 8 and verse number 11, that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. So here, here's what I'm going to do. I, I wrote these down. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go sit down with Elijah and say, Elijah, tell me what it looked like when fire came from heaven and burned everything up. Elijah, tell me the story. I, I, I'll tell you who else I'm going to sit down with. I'm going to go sit down with Samson. So I'm in the military. I want to meet the guy that took the jawbone of a donkey and killed a thousand warriors with it. And then, and then you know what happened? His jawbone turned, turned into a water fountain and water shot up out of it. I'm going to say, tell me that story. But I, I can tell you some more. David, I'm going to say, tell me how you killed the bear. Show me your swing for Goliath. I mean, David, did you actually invent the song, only a boy named David, only a little sling? I mean, did you invent that? Noah. Where did, what, what did the plans look like, Noah? Did you just start building an ark one day? A hundred years? Did you just start building an ark one day and it just happened or what happened? Paul? Daniel? Can you imagine Daniel? Now, were those, what were the lions like? When you knew, Daniel, that they couldn't bite you, did you just like put your feet on them? Did you like go snuggle up with them and like palm? You, you want some of me? I mean, how did you do that? You say, Brother Mark, I'm saying that we're going to meet. But you know who else I'm going to meet? Brother Luke, Miss Brittany, you're going to meet Blake's brother. See, before Brother Luke, Miss Brittany had Blake, they had a miscarriage. You'll get to meet him. You're going to walk in. And somebody's going to come up to you and go, hey, Dad. Mom and Dad who have gone on before, we're going to meet them. For those who know Christ, we're going to see them again. Remember the old song? May the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by. Yeah, the family circle. I remember being with my grandmother. My grandmother said this, honey. I'm ready to go to heaven because I've got more friends and family over there than I do over here. We're going to involve, it involves not only a new buddy, but it involves a new building. You say, well, what building will that be in my father's house or many mansions? If it were not so, I would have told you, behold, I go and prepare a place for you. You say, well, I live in a pretty nice house. It doesn't compare to over there. I'm glad the King James Bible says in my father's house are many mansions, not just rooms. I'm looking for a mansion, not just a room. Amen. I'm looking forward to the, the big house. My dad used to say this, a tent or a cottage, I really don't care because they're building a mansion for me over there. In fact, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 9, I hath not seen nor ear heard what God has prepared. Let me give you this and I'm done. The landing involves a blessing. It involves a blessing. Revelation 22 and verse number 3 says this, and there shall be no more curse but the throne of God and the Lamb of God shall be in it no more curse Miss Brittany would you come let me give you this and I'm finished you say brother Mark what's going to happen when the rapture takes place will the church close down no nope. no nope, church won't close down Brother Daniel, in fact, probably when the rapture takes place, the next Sunday the church house will be full. It's going to be full because they're going to wonder what's happened. You say, but how would the world believe a lie? Well, they, we had an airplane disappear. And how will they believe that? So the next Sunday the church house is going to be full and they're going to knock on the doors and people are going to come in here and they're going to fill these pews, but I'm not going to be here. I'm gone. And so they're going to be seated everywhere, and they're going to go, what are we going to do now? What are we going to do? My kids, they were with me, and they're gone. I, I got up to get them ready for school. My kids were not in the room. There, there was empty beds. Their clothes were left behind. What's happened? They're going to start talking about aliens, and they're going to start talking about everything else, alien abductions. But here's what's happened. The rapture's taking place. But see, the problem with the rapture is, if you're not prepared, the Bible says that he will send strong delusion, and you will believe a lie. You say, but I've read my Bible. 
Pastor Mark, I've read my Bible. I know where everybody's going to be. No, you're going to believe it's whatever the TV or the internet tells you. There's no more hope to be saved in. Are you ready? Are you saved? Or are you going to be left behind? Will that be you, nothing but clothes? Your soul's with the Lord. At a youth camp not far from here, a friend of mine was a camp director in Corden, Indiana, Reno Likens. They had a little boy that drowned in their swimming pool. Tragic accident, 12, 13-year-old boy. The little boy had what was called a silent drowning. A silent drowning. You say, what does that mean? I don't understand all the medical understanding of this and grasp all of that. But I can tell you this. Here's what happened. The doctor explained to them that he panicked when he swallowed that water, got a gulp of water. And he was crying for help. But he couldn't cry out loud. And he just silently drowned, literally feet from people who could have helped him. No one knew that he needed help because he said nothing. He could not do anything to help himself. He just silently drowned. It would be so sad for you to silently drown in a church of people that love you, that have been right where you're at. Don't sit there with no remark on your face. Ask for help because I know a God who can and will help you no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done. He will save you. Don't drown silently. Wake up in a lake of fire. But rather call upon the name of the Lord and ye shall be saved. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I want to ask just a couple questions this morning. We'll be finished. How many of you would say, preacher, I know. I know that if there was a rapture today, I'm sure that if there was a rapture, that I would be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. There's no doubts in my mind. There's no questions in my mind. There's no I hope I would make it. Heads bowed, eyes closed. No one moving around. No one moving around. Just in the quietness of the moment, how many of you would say, Preacher, if the rapture were to take place today, I know my home, my address would be heaven. Would you slip your hand up if that's you? Lots of hands around the room. Thank you. You can put them down. I would never come to you. I would never embarrass you in any way. I just want you to be honest before God. There's no one else looking but me. Is there anyone that would say, Preacher, I'm just not sure. If the rapture were to take place today, I'm just not sure that I would be caught away. And Preacher, I don't want to be left behind. Pray for me. I'm not going to follow this up with something sneaky. I just want to pray for you. Preacher, I'm not sure that if the rapture took place today that I would go to heaven. I want you to pray for me. If that's you, would you slip your hand up around the building? Lots of hands. Thank you. You can put them down. Lots of hands. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Is there anybody else that would join these? Preacher, that's me. I didn't raise my hand the first time, but I'm just not sure if the rapture were to take place that I would go to heaven. Thank you. I see that hand. You can put it down. Thank you. I see that hand. You can put it down. Here's what you have to do. Say, Preacher, I... I don't want to keep living this way. I don't want to continue this way. Good. I didn't either. And I was a 17-year-old boy sitting in a church pew just like you are. And they gave the invitation, just like I'm about to do. And I came forward and I responded. And I had somebody take the Bible and show me how I could know that I was saved. In just a minute, if you raised your hand, I'm going to be standing right down here at the front. My wife will be standing right here or sitting right here at the front. If you're a lady, she could take the Bible. If you're a man, I would love to take the Word of God and pray with you so that you could know where you're going to spend eternity and be ready for the day of the Lord. Because the Bible said in the book of James, the coming of the Lord is nigh. It's close, like a thief in the night. The last question I'll ask, and we'll 
pray and be finished. Preacher, in light of the rapture, the Lord spoke to me about some things in my life I need to change. In light of the rapture, the Lord spoke to me in my heart about some things in my life I need to change. Preacher, that's me. Pray that I'll be ready for the rapture. If that's you, would you slip your hand up all around the room? Lots of hands. Thank you. You can put them down. Let's stand our feet if you would. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. Father, I pray that you would draw them into yourself this morning. Lord, I pray that whether it be a man, woman, or a child, if they're not prepared to stand before you, God, I pray that they would come and get that settled this morning. God, please, we thank you for your love. We thank you for what you did for us on Calvary. We thank you for the warning of your word telling us that that day is drawing nigh. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads are about